everyone and welcome to Edible Education. This is our 11th class meeting. If you're just coming in, I'd love it if you'd sit in the front here just to fill in the seats. It just makes it a little bit easier on our guests to relate to you in this very big auditorium. I'll just remind you this is a technology-free zone. So if you're here in person, please give us your full attention. If you're at home watching on your computer, you're allowed to use your technology. Does anybody know what this is this week? From my garden, what species this is? I hear artichoke, wrong. Anybody? That is a leek about to burst into flower. That's from the allium family, the onion family. That, to me, that's a picture that's all about potential. So the theme of tonight's session is potential. We actually um, ended up kind of serendipitously Lucky, I had in, originally invited two other guests. One, unfortunately, had to go to a family funeral, and the other had to fly to Italy. So we actually get my very, don't tell them this, special guest, Kristen Richmond, who's a, uh, a graduate of Berkeley, and will tell you the story, her amazing story of, uh, from idea to impact tonight. And we're going to... Um, focus on systems innovation tonight. We're gonna to try to pull together everything we've been learning, all these disparate um, issues in the food system, and we've been looking at all the challenges and opportunities. Tonight, we're gonna to pull it all together for you into a really coherent business model and venture. Given that this is now in the business school, we're going to come full force into how all of these dynamics that we've been studying turn into a real value proposition in the marketplace and in society. Um, before that, a couple of announcements. So I have posted the readings for next week and the following week on B courses, okay? There's just several light readings. Next week, we have Corby Coomer coming, who is a celebrated journalist, probably one of the most famous food journalists um, around, very thoughtful man, flying all the way here from Boston to talk to us about his work in food security. We're also going to have a special guest, Mark Ryle, who uh, is the CEO of Project Open Hand, which is one of the really interesting long-term uh, nonprofit uh, providers of meals here in the Bay Area. And then following that, Michael Pollan has um, agreed to join us for the final class. And he's going to be joined by another Berkeley alum named Liz Carlisle, who's written a wonderful book called Lentil Underground. So I've given you a, one of Michael's most recent writings uh, that would appear in Civil Eats about where do we go from here in the food movement. And then I've given you the prologue of Lentil Underground. Um, I've also posted the final assignment, which I hope you find enlightening, uh, inspiring, and maybe a little bit challenging. I'll outline it for you. The idea of this last assignment is to pick a topic during the course, a specific subject that you particularly are interested and passionate about, and talk about why it's important to you, maybe how learning about it has changed your own behaviors or attitudes or perspectives, and then talk about like what commitments you've made to that change and what commitments you'd like to see implemented in the broader culture and society. This is all written out for you, so you don't have to write it down. Then the second part of this is really the fun, challenging part, is that you find somebody in your circle of relationships, like your a friend or a relative, who doesn't necessarily share your views. So somebody that you can be sort of agreeably disagreeable with, you know, and your, your job is to share with them what you've learned about food and hopefully come to some uh, shared understanding or at least to come to learn what their perspective is. And you're going to capture this conversation and write about what you've learned. So you can read the assignment, you can read the rubric. Um, we've given you till April 20th, which is the following Friday after the last class. So you have, you know, several weeks to get this done. And if you have any questions, contact the um, teaching team right away, okay? So I'm really looking forward to that um, 
this should be a really nice follow-on to the last paper you wrote. Let's see, oh, I'd like Rohini to just spend a few minutes. Rohini, as you know, is the GSI for this course, and she's also a public policy student, and every week she enlightens me about bills that were passed or laws that are made or um, just really consequential things that are happening in the United States despite um, this class. So what I wanted to do is ask her to spend maybe you know three, four minutes just reporting on what happened last week. And I'll, I'll give you this beautiful picture behind you. Hey, everyone. I hope you had a good spring break. Um, while we were away, two really big things happened in the world of food and ag. Uh, the first one is kind of pictured up here in Kansas. Uh, the governor called what was so-called the Tyson Bill. Um, and basically, it lo loosens a lot of rules that govern uh, how chickens are raised in slaughter, giving a, more power to the corporations. Um, and the second issue is that um, really relates to the class that we last had uh, that Mary Nestle talked about. Um, Nestle, Michigan gave Nestle the right to water extraction rights. Um, and the reason why these two issues are really big was that they received enormous amounts of public comments against uh, both of these issues from happening, but they still passed. Um, so, for example, in the Michigan issue, they got around 86,000 public comments against giving Nestle the water rights and only five comments for it, uh, but the bill still came into action. So it's just two big things to pay attention to uh, that happened while we were off enjoying the beginning of spring. Thank you. Thanks for that update. Um, two more things. Uh, uh, Haas just announced a sustainable food initiative, which is very exciting. I'm really uh, happy and proud to be associated with it. Tomorrow night, uh, in this very room at 6 p.m., we're going to have a Berkeley Entrepreneurs Forum, which is a special evening dedicated to entrepreneurship. It's open to the community. You're welcome to come. You can sign up. Um, I think the CRB or the um, entrepreneurship website has an event bright. Um, it's co-hosted by Food at Haas, which is a very dynamic club here if you're not already involved with it. And we've also uh, now gotten approval for a course in the fall called Food Innovation Studio, which is going to be, um, it's intended to be a graduate uh, program on how ideas turn into innovations and businesses. We'll tell you a little bit more about kind of the prerequisite, not the prerequisite, the pre-story to that when Kristen gets up to, uh, to talk to us. But I just wanted to uh, be sure to invite you uh, to that tomorrow night, six to eight. And there's kind of a mixer beforehand. And then there's a panel with five really interesting people in the food tech innovation space joining us. And I will be moderating. So, you know, this class, one of the uh, key themes in the class has been about learning to see systems and learning how and where to intervene in a system. And we have, um, you know, kind of been using this backdrop of Danella Meadows dancing with systems as just kind of a theme song throughout the semester. And so I thought it would be really interesting tonight to talk about how um, one actually designs an entrepreneurial intervention, if you will, mixing the language of public policy and business a little bit to create a new um, kind of solution for a pressing problem. So um, I thought I would try to explain what I mean by food systems innovation. And this, to me, is kind of a coordinated uh, approach to solving a problem. A lot of times people in business, they try to build a better mousetrap. So they're trying to build a better product or a better service. People use the word platform very frequently now. But what I'm thinking about in food as systems innovation is something that not only provides a new product with distinct competitive advantage, um, like maybe better taste, better price, better convenience, um, better outcomes, whatever the, um, the key selling points or points of differentiation are, but also kind of a coordinated way to innovate across the culture and the society and the supply chain. So what's interesting with systems innovation is you could think about not only um, thinking about how to change 
tastes through, say, product and, um, and education. You could also try to shift the cultural norms by working in the community. You could work on shifting habits by providing models and incentives. You could shift laws, policies, regulations. You might do um, clinical studies to produce evidence that shows that your solution actually generates better health outcomes. Um, you could do all kinds of things that would contribute um, to the effectiveness and the attractiveness of your solution. And what you're going to hear about tonight is the way a remarkable company does that. And we're going to be focusing tonight a case study on Revolution Foods and how it's approached systems innovation. Revolution Foods, as you're about to learn, is actually a company that began here at Berkeley. It actually began um, in a social entrepreneurship class that I had the pleasure of being in about 12 years ago. And it went from idea to literally conception and birth, right, during the school year. And its uh, co-founder and CEO is with us tonight. She's going to talk to you about how she has systematically and proactively designed the business to incorporate the values that we've been talking about this year, better health, better personal health, better planetary sustainability, fair, you know, better justice, how these values are actually designed into the business and operationalized for competitive advantage. So that's what we're gonna focus on tonight. So I'm gonna show you a quick video. Before they, I do that, I'm just gonna mention that Chris Richmond got her MBA here in 2006. Her co-founder, Kirsten Toby, is also a, an alumna of Haas. And both of them have been incredibly generous at coming back here um, to teach and share and mentor and coach. And you know, to me, when I think about my life's work, what Chris and um, Kier have done over these last 10, 12, 14 years has just been absolutely remarkable and something of which um, we should all be proud. So let me start by showing you just a one minute video. The context for this video is that um, this video was made by Citibank at, with, at no cost to the company because Citibank was very interested in highlighting community-centric businesses that they were partnering with. So to me, not only was this a wonderful kind of um, exposure for Revolution Foods, but it was like brilliant marketing. If you, were, if you were just to be sheerly like tactical about it, this was an amazing way for to get national exposure as a tiny company. And one of the things we talk a lot about in entrepreneurship is as a small company, as a challenger brand, how do you sort of punch way above your weight? How do you look like a much bigger, more established, more formidable force in the marketplace than you actually are in terms of your age or scale? And this is like a perfect example of that. So let me um, share it with you and then give a warm welcome to Chris Richmond. 20 million kids every day in our country lack access to healthy food. For the first time, American kids are slated to live a shorter lifespan than their parents. It's a problem that we can turn around and change. Revolution Foods is a company we started to provide access to healthy, affordable, kid-inspired, chef-crafted food. We looked at what are the aspects of food that will help set up kids for success. Making sure foods are made with high quality ingredients and prepared fresh every day. Our collaboration with City has helped us really accelerate the expansion of our business in terms of how many communities we can serve. Working with City has also helped to fuel our innovation process and the speed at which we can bring new products into the grocery stores. We're employing a thousand people across 27 urban areas and today serve over one million meals a week. Until every kid has built those lifelong eating habits, we'll keep working. Over 20 million kids Oops. every day. Chris Richmond, please give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank so you. <laughs> All right. 
It is wonderful to be here, you guys. Um, as Will said, it all started for me and for Kier and for Revolution Foods, literally in this room. So in 2004, I was attending math camp before business school, and I was sitting right about where you were sitting, and Kier was sitting right about where you were sitting, and one of our good friends introduced us and said, you know what, you guys haven't met yet, but you should definitely meet. You have a lot of the same interests, and we're in the same business school class. 12 years later, we have the most amazing partnership you can imagine. We uh, have been working together hand in hand to start Revolution Foods and to grow the business. Um, we've also had five kids between the two of us. She's had three girls, I've had two boys, so we've not only kind of grown our respective families, but we've grown our company and our impact. And it's a really special night for me to be here because I both have, this is, a, it's kind of amazing. I'm going to look back on this, but uh, Will, who was my professor of social entrepreneurship, where we literally crafted the business plan for what would become Revolution Foods, piloted it, met our first investors, DBL and Dick, which brings me to my next point. We have our seed investor, Dick Beers here, who literally got us off the ground financially. So without Dick contributing, we just, we never would have been here. Um, there are people who believe in you from day one and really give you a start to build your dream. Um, and that's represented here in this room. And I have chills all over my body. Um, so you guys know what our mission is because you just saw that video. But we have been committed uh, since we started Revolution Foods to dramatically increasing access to healthy, affordable, delicious, nutritious food for all kids. Um, we say building lifelong healthy eaters by making kid-inspired chef-crafted food accessible to all. And there are two very important parts of that sentence. One is the health aspect and how important the quality of what we feed our youth and families is. The other piece is the all at the end, which really speaks to our commitment to access and to making sure that our nation's most underserved communities have access to the highest quality food possible. And that's what brought us together here at Haas. Um, Kira and I went through our first year, took our kind of core classes, but very early on realized that we both had a shared vision to start what would become Revolution Foods. Um, we both had come from education. I actually was started my career on Wall Street uh, as an investment banker, but then moved um, a few years in to Nairobi, Kenya to start a school uh, focused on students with learning disabilities. And part, as part of my job, um, the education team there let me teach two classes. And so I had super firsthand experience um, with the correlation between how healthy students were, the access to meals and nutrition that they had or not, and how they performed in the classroom and out of the classroom. Um, so it was very, very clear to me this very basic link of nutrition as a lever to set students up for success. Kier had been a classroom teacher since the day she graduated college. So she is a lifetime educator and teacher prior to starting Revolution Foods. She actually taught food systems change when she was at Brown University. Um, she taught it in a, in a volunteer sense. Um, but, you know, very, very deep connection. The second piece um, that we both knew was, as we started researching this, we looked at what does the market look like? So we quickly learned that School meals in particular, and we've since expanded even beyond school meals, but school meals in particular is a $20 billion addressable market in the US. And when we were looking into this, there was not one, not one for-profit entity that was prioritizing quality and nutrition for kids. Not one. So you kind of do the math and you say $20 billion market, no quality player, you go talk to consumers and find very quickly in schools and um, whether you're talking to principals or teachers, you find very, very quickly that they're completely dissatisfied with their options. Then you go into the lunchroom and ask students, you know, is the food that you're being served, do you like it? Does it respect you? Um, and the answer across the board was absolutely not. It's disgusting. We know it's not healthy, but not only is it not healthy, it doesn't taste good. It doesn't look good. You know, my chicken bites are still frozen inside. My breakfast pizza is dripping oil on my shirt. Um, I can go on and on. But basically, we knew right away that there was a huge unmet demand. 
So then that led us to building the financial model and the operating model for what would become Rev Foods. And just a quick show of hands, who um, in this classroom is or wants to be an entrepreneur? Quite a few, quite a few hands. So I always say um, when I'm talking about the founding story, always run a pilot if you can, um, because as much as you feel like it may not be representative of your aspirations and where you wanna go with the business model, the learnings even at a tiny scale of prototyping something and seeing how, in our case, kids related to food, seeing how teachers accepted us, seeing how the lunchroom line would work and how students flowed through it, and then finally bringing investors to that little pilot in Oakland and saying, this is the impact we can have. Imagine this times you know, a million uh, was a huge part of us getting funded. So I, I am very um, adamant about um, telling folks, please run pilots when you have an idea. Mock it up, prototype it, get it going, because you can learn more doing that, as much or more doing that as you do in the visioning stage. Um, so, just to walk through a few of these slides, and then I would love just interactive Q&A, because that's my favorite part, is to get to you know, what, what you guys want to talk about and what Will wants to talk about. Um, my title, Bucking the Trend of Food as a Privilege, clearly a huge focus for us. Um, when Kira and I were starting out, there were a few there were a few very, very dire statistics that we were reading um, that inspired us to get going quickly. Um, and a lot of you are aware, just sitting in this class, of the magnitude of health issues in this country as they relate to poor nutrition. Um, number one, and sorry, my slide's a little off here, but obesity will cost the US healthcare system more than $1 trillion over the next five years. Number two, and this one is the, was the most staggering to us and remains the most staggering, Overall, one in three children born after 2000 will be diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. In the communities that we serve, in our urban, underserved communities across the US, that number is closer to 50%. So completely preventable um, and incredibly serious. And then last but not least, you heard this in the video, but for the first time ever, children in America um, are slated to have a shorter lifespan than their parents due to poor nutrition where that exists. So we set out with, we set out with a, um, a, a real vision to create a scalable solution to this issue. And I, I really emphasize scalable because I think it matters a lot. You can solve problems on a very localized level, <coughs> excuse me, um, or you can decide to solve problems on a global or extremely scalable level. And it does really play into how you set up your organization. Um, for us, we felt like this was a huge problem that merited a huge solution. And for the record, I believe that child nutrition and community nutrition and school nutrition actually deserves multiple solutions. So as we talk about systems change, we'll talk about how we partner with nonprofits all over the country. In some cases, we partner with other for-profits to really look at who has a core competency in what area, whether it's gardens and schools, whether it's nutrition education, whether it's adult cooking classes and family cooking classes, or whether it is literally getting 2.4 million healthy meals into students' bellies every single week around the country. Um, so we wanted to create a scalable solution, and that led us to choose to become a for-profit entity. We wanted to raise capital at scale and felt that we could do that because the model itself had a, had a, a very clear revenue stream coming in, very clear, I say clear, but at that point we were modeling the cost stream associated with it, and we felt like we could create a very sustainable and healthy financial model to deliver upon a scalable solution. So that led us into the land of um, raising money from values-based investors. That's a whole other topic that we can talk more about, but one of the benefits I had in Will's class, um, and certainly in meeting Dick, was connecting with, I would say, kind of the first wave of investors who are calling themselves impact investors. 
Today, you go to a conference in Chicago on impact investing and Carlyle Group and TPG and KKR and you know every Bain, every um, big financial company under the moon, I feel like has an impact investing arm. That's really important to know. Um, my, my second tip for aspiring entrepreneurs is there's lots of capital out there for great ideas. There's an actual shortage of deal flow. So it's a great time to be an entrepreneur with a systems changing values based approach because investors are looking for that. They're looking for that kind of systems change. And everyone who's invested in Revolution Foods has invested on the theory of doing business, doing good business by doing well for our stakeholders and community. And you see countless examples of companies who are working on those same things right now across multiple segments. Um, so we set out to create a scalable model um, to revolutionize community and school nutrition. So there were a few movements that inspired us along the way when you think about starting a movement. And um, you know, one of them I put up here, the seatbelt movement. So when I was a kid growing up in San Antonio, Texas, not so common that everyone knew got to put on a seatbelt to you know, protect yourself when you get into a car. Statistics weren't that well known um, around health risks, et cetera. But today, you really wouldn't dream of getting into a car in most cases without putting on a seatbelt, because you know the risk. Data, awareness, education led to that. Uh-oh, you can barely see this. This is a smoking secession uh, movement, largely driven by teenagers, right? The last one, so it's a little bit hard to see, but the last one is recycling and the environmental awareness movement. And this one was probably most inspiring to us because it's driven by kids. Um, and I don't know how many of you guys went to the, the March for Our Lives protest recently, but I took my little boys um, who are eight and 11 now, not only because I believe in the issue, but also because I wanted to drive home the idea that youth voice really, really matters. And perhaps it is the most important thing in driving movements across our society. So you see the recycling movement. This is, you know, classic example of, you know, the little kid coming home and saying, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, don't throw that away. That hurts the earth. We have to recycle and later we have to compost. So, you know, movements that are driven by youth and by community really inspired us. So where are we today? Um, so we are, and I'll talk about the systems change element in a moment, um, but we are now serving 2.4 million healthy meals per week across 30 cities, across 2,000 schools and community sites all across the country, and that ranges from K-12 schools, district schools, charter schools, um, after school programs. I was actually on the, head of, on the phone with the head of the YMCA nationally today, boys and girls clubs, Head Start programs, community feeding programs. So we're really entering into the zone now of what I call citywide wellness where there is a community program to be served, whether it's on a basketball court, at a park, whether it's in a church, whether it's a community center, whether it's an elementary school at San Francisco Unified, that's where you find Revolution Foods creating access to healthy breakfast, lunch, and suppers every day of the week, pretty much every day of the year now. Um, so really exciting, again, when you kind of think about the impact. When we started, we were serving school lunches that impact, and to Will's earlier statement, that platform access is so much larger than it was. Um, so just as an example, in our first year, we served 70,000 healthy meals in one city. This year, we will serve 150 million meals in 30 cities. Um, we're about a $160 million company overall. That's our revenue line. And in some ways, like I stand up here and I say, wow, we've grown so large. In other ways, we're tiny compared to some of the large food companies and large CPG companies. You mentioned Tyson, um, you mentioned Nestle, you know, $60 billion companies, right? We're tiny compared to them, but the inspiring part of this, and again, it's taken me about a decade to, to be able to stand up here and say this, is that even at 150 million in revenue, 150, 160 million, you can actually have a catalytic impact on the bigger system. That's exciting, it's really exciting. And I'll talk more about that. The other thing that is not showing up here is we're a B Corp. Um, so B, do you guys know B Corp? Does anybody know B Corp here? B 
few of you. OK. Um, so B Corp is a movement that started right alongside uh, Revolution Foods and right alongside the impact investing movement. Um, B Corp is a way for a company, a for-profit company, to certify and say, our values, which for us are the quality of meals we serve our kids, the fact that there's no artificial anything in the food we serve, no artificial colors, no artificial flavors, no high fructose corn syrup, the quality we serve our kids, and the way we treat our team, the way we treat our employees, and the focus on access. So making sure that Revolution Foods is always targeted to the broader community and students who need us the most and families that need us the most. That's really baked in to not only the mission that I've talked about, that would be, you know, if you were in my office in Oakland, you'd see it across the walls, but actually our investors have approved and have signed on to that being part of our governance. So it's really, really important. Years ago, this didn't exist. Um, our governance says that when we make a decision, we both consider the financial impact and the impact to community stakeholders. Again, our team, our kids, our families. Um, I'm going to make an argument, though, that there's not really a trade-off between financial value and social and mission values. Um, probably one of the things that kept me up most at night when I was just starting was this question. And I got asked on every panel, oh my gosh, how many times are you going to have to trade off your, your social mission values to create more financial value? And Kristen, isn't it you're raising money from these VCs? Like, aren't you going to get you know, pushed into a wall eventually where you're going to have to lower your food quality, maximize your margin, and you know, there goes Rev Foods authenticity out the door? What actually has happened, and again, what is so promising for all of you in this class, is that my favorite saying, and it drives my team crazy, um, probably because I say it so much, is that what's turned out is our values have actually created our value financially. And I say that because it's really authentic brands that connect with consumers and offer a real transparent value proposition and stand and live by those values translates directly into the differentiation and financial value of the company. It also translates into the talent that you can recruit. So Will, I love you said, how do you punch above your weight as an entrepreneur? How do you, how do you have a billion dollar brand with a $150 million company? Part of that is having these values that you live by that are born in your DNA you see a lot of big food companies out there saying, we're going to back up and figure out how to be values based and figure out what our mission is and figure out how to incorporate you know, great values into our company. It's really hard to do, really hard to do if you don't start with that in your DNA. Um, and talent sees that. And so we have consistently been able to recruit um, leaders across the company who really could go anywhere. You know, and do anything, and have decided to come and work with Revolution Foods because they believe so much in having building a legacy for themselves in terms of impact and really contributing every day to something that's so tangible and inspiring for them. Um, they also believe in the equity value. Back to those value, value creates your values, right? Or values create your value. Um, they believe in the equity value of the company that we're building through building an authentic, differentiated brand. So we took the leap. Um, a couple things I wanted to mention is something else that companies in our space weren't doing, and I feel like a lot of companies still don't do, is listen to their consumers, right? So we didn't kind of sit in our, um, our you know, Anderson Auditorium and Haas and say, we know exactly what kids in West Oakland want to eat. We know exactly what kids in Newark, New Jersey want to eat, or you know, in DC or Houston. Um, we actually went out and listened to students and said, what is important to you in your food? It is a two-way street. You know, We may have great food standards that we stick to in our supply chain and clean label, but that means nothing unless the product and the food is accepted and really delights the students that we serve. Um, so that's a really, really important, important part of our model. Um, and again, like once you create, and we're always in the process of doing this, we will never have it completely nailed because it's a daily iteration. But once you create a menu bank of beautiful products that are not just healthy, but they're also amazingly culturally diverse. 
again, from Houston to Oakland to DC to Louisiana. Um, you are able to kind of create an asset for yourself um, that is extraordinarily valuable as well as is driving health impact every day of the week. Oh, so here were, these are pictures I took while we were at Haas, so I wanted to put these up. Um, this, was, this was a school right down the road that we went to when we were starting. This is what students were eating um, before you know, we, came, we came into the picture and we wanted to kind of chronicle what food looked like in the community at that point. And here's an example of our food, and I've already gone through our food standards, but again, really, really um, focus not only on the health aspect of it and the quality of it, but the design piece. So one of the best days of my career um, of 12 years was last April, so it was exactly a year ago. We received um, data from UC Berkeley and the Nutrition Policy Institute confirming that the approach of our um, nutrition for school meals and the approach of our healthy meals in terms of design were positively driving academic outcomes. So clear validation of the approach and the, out the outcomes for kids in schools. So really important from an impact standpoint, also really important from a growth standpoint, because when you're going to speak with the mayor of Indianapolis or the mayor of Boston or the superintendent in Houston, and you can say, Dr. Carranza, this is, you know, Revolution Foods is an important investment for your school or your city. It goes from being a sort of a nice to have, like, oh, I know that's the right thing to do, to an absolute imperative. Meaning, if I'm not doing this for my community right now, I am selling short my kids and their future and their health and their academic outcome. So really important to think about how to validate your approach through third party objective um, data because it makes a world of difference um, when you're out growing, selling, and again, building a mission-driven brand. Also really important in the current administration because you think about what's going on in, in Washington and thinking about all the trade-offs that are being made and considered. And when you can say, you know, again, investing in healthy meals and healthy food for our urban communities is not a nice to have. It's actually a super high ROI, very low cost investment relative to the health of the community. That's a very, that speaks to a very different mind than you know, people who just naturally say, of course it's the right thing to do, right? It speaks in a very quantitative fashion when you are in any kind of policy debate. One of our students. Um, so again, just put this up to kind of show our evolution. Um, we expanded from, people often ask me, you know, oh, did you know this is gonna be so big? And I, I thought we started really knowing it in our first year when we're sitting in this tiny little um, office in Emeryville, and we have this tiny little kitchen. We're producing 300 meals a day, and we're getting calls from you know, principals in Chicago and Houston and DC saying, how can I, I've heard that there's a company that is actually creating healthy, delicious meals for an affordable price. So I knew at that point, and I think Kier knew at that point that this was a, a big, big idea, um, and we kept investing and we kept growing. Very exciting, but now we are across California, Texas, um, Louisiana, up across the uh, eastern seaboard in the Mid-Atlantic and um, New York, New Jersey, Boston, New England. Uh, we're still not in the Midwest or the, the Southeast in Florida, so there are a couple areas that, you know, of, of a lot of density that we want to get to in the next year or two. Um, and then, I'm so sorry, my slides are messed up. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll just talk you through this one. Um, so this is, I thought this would be interesting for this class. This was our bid for the school district of Philadelphia. So instead of just coming in and bidding on the school district of Philadelphia and saying, you know, we have a healthy solution for your community, and this is, this is a school district that had had horrible quality food for kids, and we knew that there was a superintendent in place who wanted to do better. And so we really thought very carefully about how do we do this in a compelling way. So we came in, we mapped out the highest need food desert areas in the city of Philadelphia and directly transposed, we directly put the school sites in those areas of highest needs and went to the superintendent and the mayor and said, 
this is, these are the communities that we want to serve in Philadelphia. Right? We've mapped this. We know the needs are highest. We know the volume will be highest. So it helps our distribution and doing it successfully. Um, but we want to really track impact and results in your highest needs communities. And I think this is one of the, the reasons that we won the bid was just kind of, again, speaking to the why behind what we do. Um, and then this is Luis. This is not just a picture of a handsome guy. This is um, an amazing man who helped me launch DC. And we launched it together. And a great example of someone who came into Revolution Foods as entry level, was washing dishes, was helping um, assemble food, has since been promoted about seven times, now leads a huge team of people and is one of our, our most key managers and leaders. And I put Luis up here because this is what healthy job creation looks like and more importantly, career creation. So again, living by those values, um, we don't just invest, we hire from the communities we serve um, and we really invest in development of people. And again, we don't do that because it's like a great statement of values to put on the wall, it actually, is a full circle, comes back to impact the quality of food because these are moms, dads, aunts, uncles, grandparents of the kids we serve. So they care doubly as much about the quality of food. It also completely curbs attrition cost in, you guys probably know food is just has an awful reputation for incredible attrition um, of, t of team members. And so we have a better retention rate we're able to invest in training and keep those people. We're able to produce a higher quality product. We're able to work with cities who want to invest in us because we're creating jobs in zones where there was incredibly high unemployment. Um, minimum wage, most people without benefits now are coming in. We work with job, um, job force employment agencies across the cities we serve to help coach people when they come in for a job to understand here are the spectrum of jobs, you know, here's what it looks like to do, whether you're a driver, or whether you're a linebacker, or whether you're a production manager, here's what it looks like, and here's the ladder for your career creation. And as a result, um, two years in a row, we were named the second fastest growing inner city job creator in the United States. So lots of jobs. Um, and again, just healthy community building, which is part of the whole circle. So I talked a little bit about platform. Will mentioned platform, so this is a good slide to think about. So once you've built a brand, and in our case, really speaking to the citywide wellness that we're serving, and then once you've built capabilities, so we now have this incredible um, just infrastructure nationwide of culinary centers, refrigerated distribution, clean label supply chain, largest clean label supply chain in, in certainly in schools, um, product design, incredible relationships and touch into the community, then how do you think about expanding from there? And how do you think about building what, what we call adjacencies, very consulting term, but what are those adjacencies that you are uniquely positioned to create where you can serve the community in our case? So you know, going from schools to thinking about how can we bring teachers and families healthy meals. So I don't know if you guys use the meal kit services like Blue Apron and Muntry and, and those, very expensive not very accessible for most families that we serve. So how do you create a version of healthy meals utilizing your infrastructure, your competency, your supply chain, your product design, your authentic brand to be able to deliver high, high quality nutrition in an affordable format to the families and the communities you serve? So that's what we're working on right now and it's incredibly exciting. It's an approach that no one has taken yet um, and again, we're in this great place where we don't have to invest millions more dollars to do it. We can basically do what we're calling micro test across the community to figure out where is the unlock where we will drive trial so people buying the product and repeat so people coming back for the product in a way that again impacts community health positively, solves problems for families out there that everyday families face um, and also creates financial value for the company. Okay, so this was my systems change slide. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about systems change um, and then we can kick off with Q&A and a discussion. But again, like a decade later, standing here looking back and thinking about how does a company that's 
relatively tiny compared to big food across the US creates systems change. And there's a few ways in the case of revolution foods that we that I think we're starting to move the needle in a meaningful way. So we've talked about healthy meals and healthy food driving academic outcomes in our schools. That's number one. We've talked about the infrastructure that we've built to provide a fresh food manufacturing environment across the US in a way that previously, you know, not much access to healthy food, a lot of access to cheap, processed, packaged, low nutrient food. Um, so creating hubs of fresh food manufacturing with clean label supply chain with the associated distribution to be able to drive citywide wellness in a way that wasn't there. Supply chain. When we started, we had no, we couldn't even find a cereal. This is a true statement. We couldn't even find a cereal that would work for our schools. When I say that would work, no artificial colors and flavors, real food, a reasonable sugar level, not off the charts, delicious and affordable enough to serve in our schools. There was not one product that worked. Every product had high fructose corn syrup um, or was a tiny little boutique, you know, Whole Foods brand that didn't even come in food service packages. So what did we do? We created our own product. We worked with co-packers, with different manufacturing companies out there to say, we are going to commission a product that we design with students to deliver on the value that we need to deliver on. So we've done that across the board for hundreds and hundreds of products, which means, and in addition to our truly fresh, our produce and um, our protein, et cetera, but I'm talking about kind of custom products that weren't available when we started that are a critical part of breakfast, lunch, snack, and supper. Um, so now there exists a clean label K-12 and community-wide supply chain where you've got, again, clean, no artificial anything, affordable, delicious, um, products for families and kids out there. The other one I'll bring up is around policy. Um, so procurement policy. So when we started, again, we had no we, we had no idea that this was out there, but we quickly learned, um, especially in Texas and Louisiana and Illinois and New Jersey, um, we just we weren't winning bids and schools couldn't work with us. And we said, what, what's going on? Like you guys want, all the community was coming to us saying, we want healthier food. They brought us in to build capabilities, but we'd get to the bid cycle and we'd lose. And what we figured out was that there was an uns, a basically kind of an urban myth, if you will, out there that procurement officers in institutions, in this case schools, had to choose the lowest price bidder, no matter what, even if it's like the worst quality food you can imagine. They said and felt that it was USDA policy that low, low price wins, no matter what. So how do you come in with a challenger product when there's an environment where a quality product can't win, if you can't be the lowest price provider? So, we went all the way up to DC, and this was during the Obama administration, and you guys can imagine Michelle Obama was a huge help to us in this. We met with her personally and talked it through and with Secretary Vilsack, um, but we went all the way up to DC and we said, we're gonna, we're gonna clarify this. Is this the case that on one hand, the USDA is saying we want healthy school meals and we want great quality food for communities across the US, and on the other hand, there's this sort of unspoken rule that cheapest bidder wins everything. And we uncovered very quickly that there was no stated policy that said this, that this was something that was interpreted and passed down and was stopping communities from being empowered to prioritize health outcomes for their kids and families. And so at this point, now we know, you know, when we go into a new community, um, in countless cities, we've addressed this and said, actually, that isn't the case. Actually, you can choose the quality bidder um, and actually, it's a lowest responsible bid environment, which means communities are empowered to prioritize health outcomes. That could be nutrition education, that could be the quality of food, that could be um, you know, cooking classes. Again, they can define it. The communities are empowered to say, we wanna prioritize 
good health outcomes and academic outcomes for our kids. And that opens up the playing field for competition and you know, ultimately in many cases for Revolution Foods to come in and successfully win with a quality product. Affordability is still very, very important. I don't want to make it sound like it's not, um, but there was room to innovate and improve and serve the community better within the means of budget. Um, so those are some of the key systems changing elements that, uh, that I wanted to speak to, and we can keep, we can keep digging in. Um, but those are a few that are sort of beyond what you might think, you know, oh, straightforward business model, catalytic, catalytic impact of systems change associated with it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. All right, sure. put that up as a as a commercial great um, well, thank you that was really inspiring um, what did you think did, who, if you've got questions or, or comments please come over to the mics and line up because I'd really like to make this as interactive as possible I mean while you're doing that I'll just I'll kick off you know, you make it sound so easy. You're, you're, you're always so ebullient and positive and, um, but having like with Dick being through 12 years of board meetings, we know that <laughs> it's not as easy as it looks. And one of the things you didn't go into detail on and given that this is in the business school, could you just explain a little bit about the cost structure, the national reimbursement rate for meals, the margin pressures. Yeah. I mean, because this issue with access um, and quality and affordability is a really high hurdle given the constraints. I mean, this is not like gourmet ghetto pricing. Yeah. So maybe explain just a little bit about that, then we'll get to the, yeah. the question. And by the way, well, thanks for the, the reality check. I happen to like love my job, so I'm extraordinarily positive. Um, however, I could sit here and talk for even longer about the failures we've had and sort of what we've learned and how we've rebounded from it and um, many, many, many failures. And even, you know, thinking about fundraising, um, finding the right investors, but you also get turned down a million times in the process by the wrong folks. So whole other whole other discussion. But in terms of the cost pressure, um, intense cost pressure. And I think for us, we Again, we, we sort of had to get to a certain scale point to be able to do what we do for big institutions. So um, we knew right away, uh, and it sometimes just happens this way, that your entry point, your early adopter customers um, are typically ones that can afford to enter early, can make quick decisions, are more innovation, more innovative in nature for us. That was like a lot of the charter schools um, that really allowed us to get our feet wet and you know charge a little more uh, than we'd be able to do in a big public district. We simply wouldn't be able to do it in a big public district. So for years, we built on a platform of those early adopters having a ton of impact, um, but not getting the shot to serve San Francisco Unified or Boston Public Schools or you know YMCA National because we simply didn't have the economies of scale in our supply chain um, for our product costs to come down. We simply didn't have the operating blueprint. So if I think about what we know today about um, waste management and efficient operations and efficient distribution routing and you know line balancing ergonomics I could go this is where we get into like lean six sigma type work um, we didn't know that to start and so it really took growing to a certain scale bringing on a world-class operating team um, maturing and driving economies through our supply chain to be able to win the big contracts. Um, and that's okay, that's, that's the way it works. And we learned a lot in the process, but we're still under intense cost pressure. Um, this what is, is that a, number, $2 and how many, um, 42 so the, cents? Or? The current school meal reimbursement rate is, is at, it's now over $3. Oh, it is, okay. <laughs> um, it's like $3 and 13 cents. So it's a little higher, um, but if you think about it, that $3 and 13 cents has to include not only the meal that a school gets, but any any associated labor or overhead. So that's not we're not able to charge three dollars and thirteen cents. That's the maximum amount that a school has to spend on every lunch served. So we charge a portion of that. Um, so if I think about you know serving that chicken teriyaki dish that you guys saw with um, you know a fresh peach and a 
RBST free milk, you're doing that in the dollar and 25 cent cost zone, it gets really daunting. And that's why you've got to then think about from my end, um, hiring incredible supply chain and operators to help you cost engineer the model. And just to, you know, add a little bit to that, it's, it's been amazing to watch people from very um, sophisticated jobs in very big companies be willing to take meaningful pay cuts to yeah. you know at a certain stage of their own career to come work for a company that has this mission and values and so again that's another form of kind of competitive advantage the culture the leadership becomes a competitive advantage and one of the things that's always struck me um, being at round the board table is that every Revolution Foods board meeting for 12 years has begun. It begins with a commitment to how the company is delivering impact, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And that's always been a grounding, um, you know, kind of drumbeat for the business. No matter what investors are at the board table, you know, whether they're big shot, you know, venture capitalists that are world famous or you know, whether the Secretary of Education is on the board or whatever, it's always, um, however the company's just grown from being at the very beginning, which I should also just mention and put a point on is that it's a women-led business. And I have to say, and Dick can back me up on this, but <laughs> in their early years, it was all women on the management team. You guys really suffered from a lack of diversity there. But in my opinion, it was the best run. I sat on a lot of boards for many years and it was the best run company I've ever had seen. Well, and there was so. just really something you know, that incredible about that. So I think you've just kind of demonstrated um, you know, so many proof points that are now so salient you know, in the conversation that we're having in the culture. So let's have some questions from the class. Yep, yeah, it's on, go ahead. I guess it's not on. Hold on one second. Can you turn it on? Are you on? Okay, try it now. Okay. You mentioned you have two big impact investors, uh, mm -hmm. both us and this equity expert. Can you elaborate about what do they expect? Uh, can you compare yeah. them with the early day, uh, early stage uh, venture investors, uh, and what's more appealing for them? So how, yeah. how can I approach them? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Let's repeat it, and just in case it didn't okay. go. So how do you approach impact investors? How do you tell your story? How do you get them interested and committed? Mm -hmm. Um, so I do think there's some of the firms I mentioned were just are much bigger. Um, but I think when we were first raising funds, um, it was really critical that we had a very tight financial model built that very clearly um, laid out our assumptions and the operating performance that we expected to have. Um, I think it is, it's so critical to be able to articulate that clearly um, and then track against that very clearly. So we talk a lot, I mean, Will's right, we start every single meeting with impact um, and we go deep into financials and performance. And I think when you're first starting out, it's a lot about, um, well, it's always for investors about market size and opportunity and quality of team. I feel like those are the two things that just, you know, are universal in what they're looking for. Um, but then, you know, right under that is how believable and credible is the financial model. And I think in the early days, there are, there's more latitude to say, you know, here is what our assumptions are. And, you know, here are the variables that we're still building out and playing with. Um, and you spend a lot of time kind of honing in those variables, um, but you keep focusing on the big market and the growth opportunity. Um, when you're at our stage at 12 years old and you know 150 million in revenue, there's a lot more pressure on predictability and making sure that 
you know, you are crossing the line to profitability. You do have clear, you're either squarely profitable or you have line of sight to profitability. Um, so that's the, that's just the kind of nuts and bolts financial side of it. Um, but I've always felt that being able to articulate that really clearly has helped us tremendously in our fundraising. People get really excited about the impact and it's clear. I mean, we've been reporting on impact statistics since the day we started, um, but being able to couple that with the financial aspect has been key. Let me add a couple things to it. So from, a, from an investor's perspective, we've, we've been an investor in the company for know, almost like 10 years mm -hmm. probably. And, um, so what we look for is a, is a team that can articulate a vision and then execution. So you're always looking for that creative tension be, between being able to really think big and then execute. So vision and execution are really critical. Also, a business model design that's integrated so that as the company scales, the impact scales. There's not a trade-off. This is not a model like, well, we're going to go serve um, food over here, and then we're going to give away pairs of shoes over here um, you know, to this other community to do good. This is a completely integrated model. Everything that they do, every choice that they make, adds to the overall value, capacity, and you know, asset that they're building. So you look for that integral design. And then you look for um, ambition, but not sort of pathological optimism, which a lot of opt you know, entrepreneurs suffer from. They have grand you know, delusions of grandeur, but they haven't sort of built up from the bottom. And I think what's been just so amazing about Revolution Foods is they really take it seriously. And again, Dick could back me up on this, but I don't think I've ever seen a company that comes so close to its um, you know, projections. And there's been years where the board says, you, you need to actually um, stretch more because you're getting too close. And then they're like, why you don't understand how much we already stretched to get that. But um, there's something about that. And it's also, you have to think about trust with your stakeholders, your investors, your partners, your suppliers. You, you make commitments and then you deliver on those. So you have to continually build that trust and then that just leads to um, getting access to the assets. Like that Citibank ad yeah. is a result yeah. of that kind of performance year after year, that a brand of that stature and magnitude would take a chance on putting a little company like this on TV and celebrating them as, as the benchmark. The, the, other, the last thing I'll say is about team, because Will brought this up. I think, you know, in the beginning, You've got a vision, you've got a lot of, you know this, like as you're doing it, a lot of people are wearing a lot of hats, you're doing kind of generalist role. As you get a little bigger, like one of the first thing investors look at is like, do you have the right experts for the right expertise areas? So it's like, do you have the world-class operator? Do you have the world-class CE or CFO? Do you have the world-class um, you know, product excellence head? And so that becomes a really, really big deal. And as you grow quickly, you know, it's pretty much for sure that you're not going to have the team that you started with as you grow. Some of them you will, absolutely, and then some of them will, you know, evolve and move on and you'll bring in, you know, more seasoned leaders for that stage of growth. Um, so certainly at our stage, qu quality and composition of team relative to the stage of growth is critical. And your job is to manage that gap because if you get somebody that's used to a much bigger company and a much larger infrastructure, they won't be nimble enough to work as an entrepreneur. Yeah. So you're always balancing this real tension between getting somebody who's been where you want to go, but not so far out in front that they can't work in the system that you have there. So it's a very interesting dynamic. And, you know, in full disclosure and candor, there are a lot of people that didn't work. Oh, yeah. There no. Were, I remember that first CFO. Anyway, we won't go. A lot of that. people that didn't work and um, a lot of people I wish I had hired sooner. Mm. So I always tell people like hire sooner than you think you need the talent because you'll just surpass that level and wish you had hired sooner. <laughs> Thanks. You want to... Dick, go ahead. Yeah, this I is Dick Beers. Quick observation. Uh, Kristen opened up my Wait, talk in the mic, Dick. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kristen mentioned to start with a prototype, get it going and all that. 
I couldn't agree more with that because before investing with Rev Foods, I worked in new business development for Time Warner for 35 years. And so in that time, I always felt you have to get started, mm -hmm. but once you do, it's always, always much tougher than you think it's gonna be. Mm -hmm. It just mm -hmm. is always the case. Mm -hmm. So to me, in addition to the plan and all, I think the great thing about Rev, Rev Foods and what I always look for is are they flexible enough to make change? A lot of things I've seen crater because this is the way it is, I'm sticking with it, that's it, as opposed to being flexible, moving on your feet. And the other one is, are they tough enough to be persistent? Because flavor of the month, oh God, this is really hard. We're gonna start a family, I, you know, how do we do this? And we could just go on and on with the anecdotes when there were problems in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Kristen and her family moved the next day to Washington, D.C. for how long, and they made it happen. And then the last point I'd want to make is on Will's point of what an exceptional leadership team they have. I've been stunned. You know, this is, I think this is probably a lot to do with women leadership. No narcissism. And it's... <laughs> stunning after a corporate life in New York to see this great spirit. So when oh, I'm gonna, thanks, thanks Dick. Dick. I'm gonna mountain school. Hi there. Hi. Hi. I've never been too tall for a microphone before. <laughs> um, so this might be a little bit of comparing apples and oranges, um, but in going back to in inv investor-based questions, um, investors are not donors, yeah. but um, my background is in the arts nonprofit, music and performance sphere. Um, and hearing you talk about ecosystem funding and sort of the messaging that appeals to those kind of investors, uh, in the arts nonprofit and music nonprofit world, the foundations have shifted to ecosystem thinking. Um, a lot of the organizations want to be shifting to ecosystem thinking and reframing the arts nonprofit sector and thinking about how it engages with other worlds. Individual donors um, are much more tied to the tangible, familiar, um, project-based funding. Right. And so I'm wondering, as much as we can compare apples and oranges, if yep. you've had that experience, and it sounds like there's been evolution in, in the food industry and in how, in, in social impact fundraising and in um, entrepreneurship too, if there's anything that you've learned about relating to that kind of donor or investor and how you can shift them more to an ecosystem, or is it about finding the right people who are already aligned but don't already see themselves as a part of that sector? That's yeah. a big broad question, but I just was curious your experience in that. Yeah, so there, that's a great question and, and huge transformation um, since I started. So just thinking about something Dick and I worked on in the early years, we were trying to get funded by Gates Foundation. We were trying, trying, trying. We were trying to connect to everyone we could. And at that point, they were really just doing grant funding. Um, and so we were looking for equity, for-profit equity investment, but with a clear social impact um, mission. And at that point, they just, it wasn't happening. They had a PRI, project-related investment arm, but that didn't really make sense for us and what we were doing. The landscape has completely shifted. So now you have foundations who are making, so we have, we have two of them I can think of. Um, Emerson Collective is one, uh, the Walton family is another. Uh, we actually have three or four of them um, who are making equity investments in Rev Foods. So again, they're looking for a return, but they're very values focused. At the same time, they're saying to us, what other grants can we make that would catalyze food transformation in urban communities? So we're like, okay, we believe that there are 50 schools in Oakland that could serve healthier food to their kids if they had refrigerators. And those refrigerators cost $2,000 each. And why don't you think about making a grant to the schools, not to Rev Food, schools own the equipment, to basically buy the infrastructure to allow them to drive health outcomes. And we've had multiple funding relationships like that now that have combined grant funding and equity funding. Same thing on the um, creating jobs in inner city communities. So when we went into New Orleans, um, Kellogg, Foundation, Kellogg Foundation invested in Rev. They invested equity, they gave us debt, and they put several hundred thousand dollars to work in grants for New Orleans schools who were looking to transform the food they were able to feed their kids. And it wasn't paying us on a meal-by-meal -meal basis. No foundational fund that, because that's, 
that's silly, right? It's like the operating cost. But it was infrastructural things that would allow them to be more successful. And the last thing I'll say is not funding, but it's winning partnerships for biz dev. The other thing I'll say is our big contracts that we've won with big districts, Boston being the most recent one, I believe we won because we came in with ecosystem partnerships. So it wasn't just Rev Foods, it was Rev Foods plus Food Corps plus Share Our Strength plus Commonwealth um, plus um, you know, the local dairy company in Boston that was delivering for us and creating more jobs for people in um, you know, the area that they're located in. So total ecosystem bidding. And we've differentiated ourselves over and over. So you're, you are right on with that thinking. What a great example. You've got a question too? Thank you. Hi, Kristen. Thank you for being here. My question is actually very similar to the first two, but I promise I'll diversify a little bit. Um, so you mentioned this several times in your piece, but the whole idea that impact investing, like double bottom line, long termism, like didn't really explode until very recently. Yeah. So I'd love, to, and I'm not sure when your first funding round was, whether that came like a little before or after, but I'd love to hear how your relationship with investors, with VCs, VCs relationships with their LPs has like kind of evolved with like the growing of this movement how that's like shifted your relationships with can all we the tell my favorite story sure the beginning of that <laughs> go ahead will <laughs> well um when Kristen and kirsten <laughs> were just about to graduate they were negotiating their first term sheet to get their first investment from a venture fund that was actually created um it was called the bay area equity fund and it was created as a double bottom line fund and um, it was funded through some of the pension money of some of the East Bay counties mm -hmm. and it had an explicit mandate about creating jobs in inner city communities and so it was it was a bold and ambitious kind of community-based finance and it also had the challenge that they had to find businesses that could actually deliver on what they were were looking for and so Kristen and Kirsten were negotiating with that fund for their first investment beyond the angels. And Kristen was in my office <laughs> um, and we were going over the term sheet. I was kind of coaching her on how to negotiate the term sheet. And she went into labor with her first child right <laughs> in my office. That's how dedicated she was. And we were like, look, she was, I had this like bouncy ball in my office and she was like sitting on it because she was very pregnant and she was like, uh-oh. <laughs> and uh, we said, oh, we better call Kristen's husband. Steve, yeah, we're uh, like. Um, but just to show you like how dedicated <laughs> she was. So that's why I always say like I'm the midwife of the company. <laughs> yeah. But from there, yep. they closed that financing. You yeah. can take the rest of the story. No, that's true. And I always say to Will, like what, how many venture capitalists have birthing balls in their office? I don't think many. <laughs> so. It was uh, only when you're married to an OBGYN. Right, only when you're married to an OBGYN, Will. Um, so, yeah, I think to the to the short termism, long termism LP structure, it's a really good question, and and it's one that's playing out for me right now. So, in in full transparency, but generally, when I think about the fact that we've been in the game for 12 years, and every single investor has stuck by our side, and I've had multiple. Um, rounds where there was more cap we could have bought out earlier shareholders with a, an incoming shareholder um, and and people have passed and said we're going to stay in until kind of the next big liquidity event happens for the company um, and that's I think that's been a real testament to the fact that it it's the investors that we've worked with are not as tied up in this idea of like you have to turn a business in four to six years or in three to five years with LP pressure breathing down their neck to turn the investment. Um, but that is a very important part of fundraising, it, which is definitely ask that question. I mean, I am so I am so direct with potential investors around what is your hold period? You know, what is your experience? Because what you really want to know is how many other folks have they invested in and held the investment and supported the company and supported the team um, to the time that was right for the company to exit. Um, now, having said that, as an entrepreneur, you've got to be really smart about 
understanding the needs around the table and saying, ooh, I, I need to be ready with a solution for those investors who are going to need to exit. Um, so that's something I'm thinking about right now and you know, really strategizing around is what is the right kind of liquidity vehicle for whoever of our amazing investors who have stuck by our side through and through to exit, um, and some won't. But I think it's an important question. 10 years ago, um, there was a lot of concern that there was always going to be a trade-off, like Kristen mentioned, between you know doing things that are going to generate financial return versus social impact. And there's something called the ERISA laws, which govern the fiduciary responsibility of the people who manage these big pension funds. And two of the largest pension funds in the, in the country are CalPERS and CalSTRS, which are California teachers and California um, employee funds. And I remember um, speaking with the people at CalSTRS who were investors in our fund about Revolution Foods. And this sort of illustrates kind of what the schizophrenia of capitalism was like, because they, they said, you know, here, here we are, they're representing all of the teachers' pensions, yeah. right? And they're like, we absolutely love this company, but don't talk to us all about impact because it's gonna, it's gonna push us over this funny edge around our fiduciary responsibility. Those rules have been written, rewritten since then. And now there's, you know, more comfort to the point that, as Kristen mentioned earlier, all of these big money managers, BlackRock, Bain, mm -hmm. TPG, now they've all got billion dollar funds focused on these issues. Whether they'll actually be able to meet the expectations that investors have, I mean, this is, this is gonna take a long time to prove out. So just to add to what you said, I'd, I'd say if you're gonna be an invest, if you're gonna be an entrepreneur in this integrated mission-driven space, you've gotta be committed for the long term. This is, you, and you have to, one thing that Chris didn't say was, you have to become really good at managing people's expectations. Mm -hmm. You have to actually sort of retrain the culture, but also at the same time, you have to prove the case over and over and over again. Yep. Really interesting that you mentioned CalSTRS because they just wrote that letter to Apple. I just thought that was really interesting, but thank you. Uh, yeah, good Thank question. you, that's a great question. Come on up. These are great questions, thanks. If you, you're up there, okay, we'll go to you next. Perfect. Hi, um, so I have a question um, that's kind of at the other end of the spectrum. So you're talking a lot about you know funding and raising um, money, but I guess going back like 10 years ago, 12 years ago, before you started all this, how did you, how do you make the jump? You know, how do you say that I have this idea and I wanna put my life into it? Um, and then, you know, how do you fund that and then make those decisions to say, I'm in a place where I can jump into this head first and dedicate my life to it? Wow. Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think if I, if I were to really think about, because of course, when you're sitting here at Berkeley, like opportunities abound, you've got, you know, companies and nonprofits and consulting firms and banks and everybody on campus trying to recruit you. So um, there is a big opportunity cost. Um, but at the same time, I remember Kier and I, I remember looking at, at her and, and talking to each other and saying, you know what? This idea is big enough and the opportunity is big enough and the impact is big enough and the timing felt right that even if we bombed miserably, we wouldn't regret one day of going after this. And so I think that is, there's something about that passion and commitment for the, the actual topic and content area um, that really pushed us far. Um, I also felt like we would learn a ton. So I started really just like the analytical side of me started looking at it and is like, well, I'm gonna learn how to raise money. Well, I'm gonna learn how to build a team. Well, I'm gonna learn how to, you know, create an operational system that I never would have. And it felt like the career pathing would be, the career pathing and, and learnings would kind of be bountiful enough, again, that even if it didn't work, like I would be a more advanced professional and human being for having done it. So I think number one was sort of the mission and impact and, and the fact that the actual content area and the opportunity felt too good to pass up. Secondly was um, this idea of you just learn so much by going for it. Um, so I think, I think those two are, are really, really important. Um, having said that, we did not have independent wealth 
we did not, I, as Will said, I had my first little baby and my husband and I were, you know, a hardworking couple. And uh, we were very clear with our investors in the beginning with DBL and with Dick and everybody, like we have to draw a salary. We have to make something. We have to be able to support our families. Um, so I think there's also a, a personal decision point too of, you know, how do you manage your own financial, your own finances? And I would say, and I've learned over time, just, you know, I don't think any of us are greedy based on the topic areas we're looking at, but also speak up for what you need um, and for what will kind of keep you motivated and sustained and in the game. Just to add a little more color commentary, it's just you can see in, in Chris this ability to kind of hold the vision and the optimism, but also like really pragmatic. So I remember the conversations where you guys were like assessing the risks, yeah. like what does failure look like? Yeah. How much risk can we take? So there was really a very pragmatic assessment on that part. And then, you know, and then as you just mentioned, it was like a collective decision with yeah. your partners too. Yeah. And um, one thing that Chris does every year that I think we all respect is she goes away on a trip <laughs> religiously. Just yep. there's nothing that stops the trip with Steve That's each right. year. And, you know, um, nobody, you know, questions it, it, it in terms of her commitment. I think um, you have to live while you're doing this. So one of the big things is that um, the entrepreneurs who the entrepreneurs who I know who have burnt out, they've kind of put things on hold. It's like, oh, I'm not going to become. I I know I want to have kids, but I'm I'm not going to do it for another four years. Or I know I want to train for a marathon, but I don't have time to do that. I'll do that when I finish this. Or I know I want to. Um, you know, take that trip to Nepal, and but I, I'm not going to do it because I can't possibly take two weeks off. Those decisions like will eventually get you. Like Kira and I always say, you've got to live your life because you're already going to be working really hard. That's a given. <laughs> so you've got to live your life as if it's your life and not put off the things that are important to you. And then when you build a much bigger team, you also set an example. So now when I think about that trip, it's as much for my team as it is for me. Like I don't want people not seeing their CEO going on vacation because then how do they, do they feel, is anyone really gonna feel like they have the permission to go on vacation if I'm not role modeling that? You know, and I, I think that's important as you think about your leadership trajectory, like what messages are, are you sending? What are you role modeling? Um, and then how are you sustaining your own spirit and self? Another testament to the uh, great program here at, at Berkeley is that <laughs> Kristen and Kirsten are as co-founders are both still running the company, yeah. which is really extraordinary when you look at the trajectory of growth. Generally, the company outgrows the founders at a much earlier point. So the growth that we've seen in each of them as yeah. leaders has really been remarkable and inspiring. This one, okay. Um, hi, thank you so much for coming. Your company was, sounds like so amazing and revolutionary. Um, thank you. I just had a more um, specific question about like the sources of the food. Um, so obviously you have a very small margin of uh, economic, Yep. The, you know, you have to do $1. Uh, meals um, and uh, we studied a lot about like sustainable ag agriculture and sustainable local farms um, do you feel like you're able to source from more sustainable farms and more local farms or because of the scale issue you need to um, uh, get it from larger scale uh, agricultural companies yeah we we actually do both um, you know, it's a there's a prioritization kind of hierarchy, and for us, the the prioritization is clean, real, no artificial food in anything we do. So real food for every child at a rate that is affordable enough to actually get to the child in whatever public school system or community we're serving. So that means with those really strict standards that we then have to look at sourcing and how much can we do um, within our sourcing parameters to meet those goals. And it, it changes over time. So when we first started, 
you know, we were clean label. We've always been clean label only, um, but we were not able to incorporate a lot of organics. Like we had specific partners um, who we worked with, like Greg Massa and Massa Rice, you know, out here, I'm thinking has been a wonderful partner um, who really grew with us. Um, Gary Hirschberg, met him through Will, Stonyfield Farms, organic yogurts. You know, we never could have afforded that at an early stage, but he saw the brand value and, you know, he literally said, where else are 70,000 public school students across the US um, gonna be able to eat Stonyfield every day? So you'll find partners like that who work with you at an early stage um, and make the price point affordable so that you can even go beyond to the next level of standard. Now that we're getting bigger, we actually have, again, enough uh, purchasing power to actually help farmers and to say, you know, we're just going to place a, a Ford contract on something and say, you know, if you can produce, you know, 100,000 apples in this price range, in this time range, we will buy them. Um, so we're able to be a little bit more creative now than we were to incorporate more local, um, more organic, more seasonal uh, than we might have been able to do in the beginning. The other thing is it also depends on area of the country. I mean, you know, California is a whole different story than Denver in the winter um, or than DC in the winter. So part of it is also um, for us, there's some geography elements to it. Uh, but we're, the cool thing about getting bigger is that you actually create more flexibility to work with a broader range of partners. Thank you. Got a question over here? Yeah. We'll have a couple more. And then we'll do our attendance question. Maybe you can get that ready. Uh, thanks for sharing your time with us tonight. And I have a little question because uh, I am a little curious about the topics of uh, trade-off because uh, uh, we know that there are many uh, scientific researches on maybe like uh, neuroscientists are doing the studies on maybe how the people's brain are perceiving the colors, maybe which colors uh, will motivate the people's purchasing decision. And maybe this is not very moral uh, or it, uh, it's uh, maybe like may, uh, will cause the malnutrition food. Uh, uh, people and children will eat more malnutrition food. And this is not very uh, good for maybe it, it's an opposite or negative effect to your program. So how do you think of this thing? Maybe uh, there is a trade-off between the uh, financial outcome and the social community outcome. So I want to know your opinion. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I think um, part of what we're doing is um, trying to change behaviors in a lot of cases when we go into a program. So um, part of that, and I think the best way to do it is by serving incredible you know, delicious, um, fresh food that really respects the students and families we're serving. Um, and I think there's a little bit of a misconception that, you know, people love like the processed lower nutrient food, it's they love junk food, et cetera. Not always the case, like certainly we're trying to undo certain, you know, habits. Um, but in a lot of cases, there is an acknowledgement that like if, if I had access to, you know, delicious food that actually smelled good, tasted good, looked good, you know, especially when it takes in input from, from students or families that are like, if you created, you know, my grandmother's pasole recipe, I would love that. Um, so I think part of it is that, that culture of respect, um, but then part of it is also engagement and education. So uh, being able to interact, we have a, a food truck right now that's going around our communities that um, we have chefs doing cooking classes where we are having students out in the parking lot of their school um, plate a rainbow. So to your point about colors, um, you know, creating beautiful, colorful meals and then going home with recipe bags and bags of produce and food to their families to recreate the same recipe. So that engagement and education is a big part of it too. I remember in the early days too, you had that Iron Chef competition yes. <laughs> with the kids from Oakland. They would come to the culinary center and they would get a little bit of instruction from the chef culinary director of Rev Foods. And then they were, you know, charged to, they would be put in teams and then they would design the meals. And then those would be a source of inspiration for what would then be rolled out in the school. So this kind of um, eater centric, you know, design was, had been very successful. Yeah. Did you yeah, have questions? Thank you. Yeah. 
Hello. Uh, you actually partly already answered my question, but you mentioned earlier that your company works with kids directly and asks them what they want to eat and what they want to see. Um, and I'd imagine that a lot of, for a lot of these kids, this is their only way that they learn about healthy eating. Um, when they go home, they might not be able to eat at all or they might only be able to eat junk food. So I was wondering if your company has um, other ways that they educate these kids directly about healthy eating and incorporates um, your mission um, into what they're learning. Yeah, so that is where um, a lot of our, talk about this idea of ecosystem partnerships. Um, so we have uh, chefs going into schools every day and taking, we actually have this very, uh, going on in a very robust fashion right now across Louisiana, um, Tennessee, Texas, and DC, like huge food feedback sessions right now. Um, so we have chefs going into schools, asking, asking opinions, designing, iterating, and doing kind of like product prototyping with students. Um, and then to your point, we do have a whole host of nutrition partners who work with us. So there's an amazing nonprofit called Food Corps, who's kind of like a sister or brother organization to us. They're a nonprofit, um, but they're funded by a lot of the same foundations that fund us. They have a full-time um, uh, sort of like a food coach who uh, is funded to come into the school and teach uh, nutrition education on a daily basis and champion garden projects and champion cooking classes and sort of reinforce on a on a day-to-day minute-to-minute basis um, the why behind the healthier food that students are eating so there's a whole host of partners we have like that um, who work you know kind of throughout the student day and school day and even family day to reinforce the mission and the importance the more we can do of that, the better. There's never enough. <laughs> yeah. Question up here. We'll make this the last one tonight. Kind of two questions. First off, thank you for coming today. And it was great seeing you. I actually saw you on Monday, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, my question was about sort of expansion, like a five-year plan. Like, where do you see yourself? You were talking about how in the United States, you're kind of like on the rim, going from California to like Texas, Louisiana, and then like back up again. Mm -hmm. So how do you plan to necessarily go into expand to the Midwest? Did you bring your investor checkbook tonight? Uh, not today. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are raising money for our Chicago and Florida facility. Um, no, you know, we are, we're doing a couple things. Um, one, again, with sort of operational evolution, we're looking at how we can serve a broader reach through our facility footprint, um, how we can kind of invest less in, in more bricks and mortar and have a broader reach. So a couple things going on. We'll probably plant facilities and culinary centers, one in the Midwest and one in Florida, just because of the density. But then what happens to Kansas City and Alaska and Minnesota, et cetera? So, for that, we're actually looking at designing a uh, product set that is, we call it Broadline, because it'll be kind of sold into Cisco and US Foods and the aggregator companies that can then, they're distributing to these institutions every day. So instead of you know serving lower quality product, they'll actually have Rev Foods clean label product in their trucks, distributing it to a school in Kansas, for instance. Um, so we're looking at both bricks and mortar expansion or culinary center expansion, but we're also looking at elevating our product and shelf life technology so that we can serve through other distributors. That way we can have a much broader reach. Well, let's have a big hand for Chris tonight. Thank you so much for coming. So great to have you here. I, I loved how all that came together. So here's the question for tonight. Take out your eye clicker. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough one. Let's see how you did. And you don't have to change your answer tonight when you see what everybody else said. How about that? <laughs> Are you ready? Ready. OK. <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah, playing around with us. OK, well, thank you. Can you switch me back? Awesome. Oh, and thank you. <laughs> See you next oh. week. Yeah, well, thank you so much.